This is Ben Woodford here at Modern Education Radio Hour on 90.1 KZSU Stanford. This is a show where we dig into everything from current research trends to far out ideas concerning any topic even remotely related to education. I'm Ben Woodford, your host here in the studio. I'll be with you every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute. Here at Modern Education, we bring cutting-edge ideas, philosophical discussions, insights from experts, and just about everything else you want to know. The goal is to help listeners interact with and understand learning in all its forms. If you have questions or suggestions for the show, you can tweet at BenWoodford1 on Twitter. I'll do my best to include your ideas in future shows. If you're a teacher, parent, student, or anyone interested in our collective future, I hope you'll tune in each week as we examine new ideas and interview guests from a variety of backgrounds. Welcome back to Modern Education. I'm here in the studio yet again with a new guest and really happy to have you back in the audience. So, my guest today is Dr. Dan L. Schwartz. He's the Dean of the Stanford University Graduate School of Education and holds the Nomalini Oliver Chair in Educational Technology. He spent eight years teaching secondary school in Los Angeles and Caltech, Alaska. He's an award-winning scientist and teacher whose specialty is producing novel and effective learning activities that also test basic hypotheses about how people learn. It's my pleasure to welcome Dean Dan Schwartz to Modern Education. Thanks for having me, Ben. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, so, I, I just want to start, you know, your, your CV was so vast as I started looking through it, I couldn't even read it to the audience if I spent yeah, the whole a, hour. It's, it's a weird thing, you know, the, if you, when you just start in this field, mm -hmm. you know, you sort of put anything you can into your CV. Right. And then after about 30 years, it's sort of like, ah, so I don't care anymore. You know? so, <laughs> it's only the things you're truly proud of. Yeah, yeah, you have pretty 10 much, pages. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, since we can't really go, even possibly go through all that, I was hoping you might just distill for the audience a couple of the the main things that stand out for you or that you're, you're most proud of or you feel like have had the most reach in your, your work? Uh, you know, everything I do, I'm proud of. It, it, they're all my children, you know, so, so you love them. Uh, a very interesting thing happened just recently. The, the Large Education Research Conference, it meets yearly. It's very big, you know, mm -hmm. it's 10,000 10, people. And this one was in New York. And uh, sort of I, I meet with my past graduate students who are, you know, faculty or leaders in industry. And I just sort of go around the room, and I realize with each one we did something unique and special that sort of launched their career. Wow! And and so that that's sort of the deepest pride, you know. As and a teacher, yeah, that must be amazing. Yeah, well, you know, I think just as a person as well, the the pride you have. The difference as a teacher is that it's not just one or two kids. You know, it's right. sort of all the graduate students, and each one got a big idea and took it forward. So so that's the pride. Uh, let me see if I can run through some of them. Yeah. So one of them was uh, teachable agents. Uh, you learn by teaching a computer that's intelligent, mm -hmm. and then the computer can sort of perform based on what you've taught it. So that turns out to be extremely effective. Another one was looking at the difference between graduate and undergra undergraduate students, and uh, uh, particularly in STEM fields. And we would give them these complex problems. And the undergraduates would all immediately try and solve the problem, whereas the graduate students would all try and make a visual representation before they tried to solve the problem. Wow. So this is an interesting, kind of an interesting phenomenon. You kind yeah. of wonder what's happened to the graduate students where it's worth it for them to actually take the time to make this visualization instead of just trying to get the problem the problem done. Do you have a sense of, of the, the mental shift that happens to value that entry uh, level? So idea? so so we we ask them, you know, yeah. did did you sort of do a utility function? Did you say, if I make this visualization and in, in the long run it'll save me time? And they said, no, they never thought about it. This is just what they do. Okay. And and so I think it has something to do with the fact that uh, in in undergraduate, a lot of times you just you're trying to get the task done, and it's a very clear task. Right. Graduate school, you're often kind of setting up the information so you can answer any question that might come along, right. as opposed to just the immediate question. I think over time you learn it's better to sort of make a general solution. It's like it's like programming, you know if. Uh, Bad programming is you make a solution for a specific problem. Good, good programming is you make a solution that's going to handle any problem. So, so it's, it's building up that functional understanding of the process instead of just yeah. trying to get an immediate solution and move on. That's right. So, so we find that a lot. Uh, so another 
Another student was really l- looking at creativity and uh, how, how do you stop people from uh, falling in love with their first idea? Mm, you know, how yeah. do you get them to stop and say, let me explore the space here? Because there's a lot of things that make you want to fall in love with your first idea. Right. You just want to be done. Uh, when you have your first idea, it catches your mind on fire, and so you just focus on it. And so you, or you just want to seek praise. And so right. if you seek praise, you know, that's a signal to don't change anything. Right, right. So, as soon as someone validates this and you're in love with yeah, it, and it's hard to move past yeah. that. And there's always a better solution at the second or third or tenth time around. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 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 So I think, I think the place I probably have the most impact is uh, kind of thinking about what kinds of uh, instruction and learning enable people to use that learning in new situations later. So, so this, is, this is called transfer. Right. So that idea of being able to take something and transfer it to a new situation. That's right. And expand it into a new set of scenarios so that you can still use what you've learned in a new way. That's right. And right. so, you know, if you, if you teach people very procedurally, uh, it's very hard for them to use the information in new settings. Right. So you kind of have to take a different approach. And so I've so- shown you know several times uh, that if you tell people and then you have them practice it's kind of the worst thing you can do okay uh, it sounds like every school I've <laughs> no, ever I know seen. I know I know well you know at colleges they're now trying to do active learning and things okay. like that but the, but the idea is you want people to explore the space and understand the problem right. that the lecture's solving you know so most yeah. of the lectures you get are based on you know some of the greatest discoveries in the history of humankind right uh, but you don't know why they're great because you've never experienced the kinds of problems they solve if you experience those problems then later on when you're out in the world and you bump into that problem you realize what you were told was very good hmm. so so lectures are good but they better show up at the right time if they show up too soon they undermine everything so it's it sounds like what you're talking about is the the valuing developing the problem and developing a familiarity with the space long yeah. before you worry about getting to some solution or final product. I think that's right. I, I don't know about long before, but but yes, <laughs> okay. I, you know it, it's uh, uh, it is stunning. You know, you sit in a college class and you're getting a lecture, and it's probably some of the most significant findings of a century, you know, because that's what the faculty are choosing to present. And you're kind of falling asleep, you know, it's dark, <laughs> it's, it's 8 a.m., you know. And so you don't get to see why this was so brilliant. Yeah. But if you've tried to work on this problem yourself, and then you see the solution, you're like, oh, that's good. That is clever. You right. Know? And so you kind of want to set that up. Yeah. And, it, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not easy. That's the hard part. It's much easier to just sort of uh, lecture, tell tell what you know, and then give people word problems. It's much right. much easier. It's right. very very hard to think of good problems for people to try and engage in. I, I think the people who may be the best at this are the ones who teach robotics courses. Mm, why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. You know, these the engineers just have this great sense of here's a great challenge for mm. you to engage in that has lots of different solution paths. And then they come in afterwards and they say, well, here, here's a very elegant solution to it. Right. But, but they're very good at this. I wonder if that's a realism based on their own experience. They understand how much those rich solutions got them into robotics. Uh, I don't know if they realize it, but it's probably <laughs> baked into them. Right. You know, when, when you ask people uh, sort of what, what got them to where they are, they, they tend to rely on worn out narratives. It's so like you ask any scientist, you know, how did you become a great scientist? They'll always say, well, there's this one person. The chances <laughs> that there was one person who got them to where they are are zero. Right. But, but it's the narrative, so they have to say that. Right. So, it's almost trying to give you the story you expect to hear. Uh, yeah. So, so when you ask people sort of how they got where they are, I, I think uh, they, their, their intuitions are partial. You know, right. It's hard right. to introspect on that. Yeah. Well, you know, that's funny because my next question is sort of along those lines. Yeah. And I want to go back. You you know, you, you started as a high school teacher, right? Or, you know, not started. You were Middle born. school. Middle, Middle school. school. Yeah, okay. yeah. Tougher. Puber- yeah. Puberty is a great age. You know, they, they're sort of uh, young enough to love you, but old enough to understand you. You know, right. high school they don't they don't love you, and elementary school they don't understand you. Yeah. So, so middle school is kind of perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's fun to think about that the sweet spot yeah, between yeah. still being willing to listen and still. It also comes with with 
problems. <laughs> it's, right. it's, you know, middle school is quite quite a period for kids. Right. So. It almost seems like those forgotten years. It's or... like prison. Just keep the kids, you know, safe and don't let anything happen. Yeah, everyone's going to pass. <laughs> just yeah. get them past it. Uh, so my, my specific question was the why. Why did you go into teaching or why did you decide to take this on as a as a lifelong pursuit? Yeah, I don't, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of happenstance. I think looking backwards, I can see the trajectory. Yeah. The, the truth of it is, uh, before I went to undergraduate, I took some time and taught in Kenya. And, oh, wow. and I did that mainly because I wanted to do uh, mountaineering in Uganda. And so this was a great chance. So I did that. And then, you know, I'd, I finished undergraduate and I had a degree in philosophy. And I, I was thinking about maybe I'd go to graduate school in philosophy. And then I decided I didn't want to be a taxi driver. And uh, <laughs> sorry, philosophers out there. <laughs> I know you get paid very well in industry. Uh-huh. Uh, so it, it turned out I could get an emergency credential. Uh, so I, within a couple of weeks, I was a credentialed teacher because they were in such a shortage in Los Angeles. And you know, teaching is like the most satisfying thing in the world. I, people don't know this. You know, it's really satisfying to help people learn, to see them grow, for them to be interested in what you have to say. And you know, lots of the arguments for teaching are sort of like you know, do social good, uh, and and we could make it a better profession. But the reason you get in teaching is because you love it. It's really satisfying. Humans were born to teach. Only humans teach. Like, uh, you know, grizzly bears, the cubs will look at their mothers to learn how to fish, but the mother never looks back to mm. see if they've learned. Only humans look back. Wow. And so it's just really a satisfying profession. I, I like it a lot. And, yeah. I li- and I've always sort of been curious about how people think. You know, the philosophy was kind of like that. So, right. so it's a good mix. Yeah, I love, you know, the... The honesty about how there is, you know, personal and and satis- inner, inner satisfying benefits to this instead of that kind of cliche. Oh, I just want to make the world a better place. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that selfish feeling of I want to feel good for having that that so, time with students. And, well, I everybody has that feeling, right? You know, it, the and and I also want to do social good. You know, so I, I taught in the toughest places and tried yeah. to make a difference. But really, the driving thing is it's satisfying. It's what keeps you in. It, it's a lot of work. You know, it's, it, it is all, you got 25 kids and they're all different, and that's just one period, and you need to sort of be on your toes. And they're, you know, if you look away, they suddenly, you know, a rubber right. band shoots across the room. <laughs> so it's a lot of work, but, it, but it's very satisfying. Yeah. So. yeah, it reminds me of uh, something I read somewhere about teachers make like a thousand decisions a day or something mm-hmm. crazy where they're constantly mm-hmm. minds are constantly having to deal with all these different things <laughs> that come across your your sphere and yeah that that's an interesting uh, I'm not quite sure I think I probably as a non-teacher make a thousand decisions as well if you consider I'm gonna stop at the red light a decision right. things like that right but, so so some of the satisfaction we made this technology called teachable agents and the mm-hmm. idea is that the students teach this computer character and uh, it turns out it just has these huge motivational benefits. So, for example, uh, we did a study where we, we used the exact same software. And in one condition, we said, this character is you, and you're just making this representation. And the other one, we said, this character is a character you're teaching, and this representation is going to help it think. Kids would spend twice as long for the character that they were teaching than the other one. Even more interesting, this is technology, they would spend twice as long reading. And you know, if you if you have people using technologies, the chances that they're going to leave that game to go read something are very low. So this is a deep satisfaction. And then when the agents would make mistakes, they would go, "Oh, I'm so sorry." But when they thought it was their character and it made a mistake, they'd shut it down. They wouldn't say anything because wow. they were embarrassed. But if it was their student, they really cared. That's really interesting because yeah. there isn't a real person. No. There is no actual conversation going on except for whatever this, I'm imagining yeah. whatever this agent is yeah. doing in response. Yeah. And so it's more of setting up that mental framing yeah. of what their expectation of their purpose is. That's right. Wow. That's right. And then teaching is just satisfying. You, you want to see, and, and we've shown sort of stunning results that uh, we've made an agent that teaches propositional logic. 
and we show that these students, in fact, learn propositional logic better than students, you know, like at college, things like that, wow. by using this. So it's it's a uh, it's there's something special about you share your idea with someone else, and then the other person sort of speaks back those ideas and you get to see what your ideas look like when they're instantiated in another person this is powerful and even when it's not a person that's right i find even when really it's not surprising a yeah there's something i always think of that personal interaction yeah. brings a lot of value but it seems like you found that you can get that value with interaction without the person being involved yeah yeah that's right uh, you can see it, it's a strong narrative when we go to young kids and we try and have them learn by teaching problem is they don't have a lot of schemas for teaching so they they just say, give it to me. Let me do it. That's mm. sort of their model of teaching. Right, right. But, you know, as you get older, people are much more clever about different yeah. ways of teaching. Um, so, so there's a simple tip here. You okay. know, yeah. uh, a lot of classes will have students do presentations at right. the end of the class, their PowerPoint or something. So this is kind of a teaching. The thing that's always missing is they don't get to find out whether the audience learned from what they taught. Right. If they found that out, they would learn much, much more from their teach from their presentation. So that would be not just saying you're going to give a presentation for the sake of giving a presentation, but there's going to be some sort of assessment afterwards, and this will be maybe the lesson to introduce a new topic or something like that. Where it's so so think of uh, you you give your end of the class talk, you know, mm -hmm. about your project. You're teaching people. You're right. teaching people what it is you discovered. For teaching to be really successful, you need to see other people reason with what you've taught them. And then suddenly you learn a tremendous, you learn more because you get to see how people used your ideas. So so it's not really, you, you don't care about testing the people watching. I mean, who, they're sitting in a class listening to your, your presentation. They, you know, they'll be curious. Mm -hmm. You as the person presenting are the one who stands to learn a great deal. You learn by teaching. But if you don't get to see how people reason with it, they don't get to ask questions, things like that, you cut it off. You lose all the benefits. Yeah. So it's I, just a little tip. I want to dig into this actually okay. a little bit from the standpoint of a teacher sitting in a classroom trying to do this. And I'm imagining some of the pushback that would come as I don't have time to let one student get the benefit when all the students need the benefit. Do you have an answer to that kind of? Oh, you mean where if all the students have to give presentations? Right. Yeah, I, I hate readouts. You know, so I do small groups all the time. Okay. I, I teach the uh, intro PhD stats class okay. in the Graduate School of Education. And, uh, you know, they do small group stuff. And so let's say you have 30 students and eight groups of, you know, four, or so, something like that. And then you have readouts in every group reads out what they did and it's it's horrible because if you if you're about to give the readout you're not listening to anybody before you mm -hmm. and after you've given the readout you're so like stimulated you can't hear anything after you and so it's the, I, I appreciate the desire of everybody getting a chance to have voice in the class but at right. the same time it's just like are we done i'm not nobody's listening and yeah so, so is so, small groups the sort of answer to that then? well small gr small groups are good uh my answer to the readouts is sort of to leave it open and just have a whole discussion rather than having each group feel that they need to report out. Okay. And okay. And, and it, it works okay. You know, so no, nobody complains. Yeah, we're so we're sort of trusting that the, the information is trickling to the students that aren't getting the chance to talk. Yeah, that's right. And they'll get their chance another time. Right. You know, okay. so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's but, great. But, but, but yeah, I think uh, trying to give everybody the benefits, uh, say, of teaching someone else and learning back, small groups are a good way. You know, because yeah. you get much more interaction. You know, we social is important for learning. Yeah. And, you know, uh, a lecture or a MOOC isn't particularly social. You yeah. Know, it doesn't it doesn't give you a lot of chances to try out the understanding on someone else, see how they respond, get their ideas, incorporate them in. Yeah. So so interaction's good. Yeah. I wonder if MOOCs could use something like this teachable ide agent idea where you bring it right back and try to teach a construct what you've done. Or Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I'm sort of looking forward to the next generation platforms that are a little more flexible. Yeah. You know, I tried to do this uh, statistics course in a MOOC, and after about three weeks, I was so frustrated because it was forcing me into a pedagogy that I just don't do. Right. And, I, you know, hopefully the next generation will allow me to do goofy things that I like to do, as opposed to, uh, here's a unit, there, there's a presentation, and then there's a problem set that gets automatically graded. Right. You know, so right. That, that was sort of the first generation. Yeah, but I think there's something interesting else that you just said there about 
being forced into a mode of teaching that doesn't work for you. Yeah. And I think a lot of teachers feel a pressure to do things a certain way because of the expectations put on them or yeah. perception of the yeah, expectations. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you're in a place and a position where you probably feel very comfortable doing things the way that's true to what you're doing. Yeah. And maybe yeah, yeah. Well, I, so it just so happens I study this. So, so, right. so I have a slight advantage of breaking out of the, the standards. I, so there's another impediment, I think, to effective teaching, which is, and I sort of discovered this recently. It hadn't quite clicked in. A lot of people don't realize that there's actually evidence that can be brought to bear about uh, teaching and education in general. So a lot of people view education as largely a normative enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you explain that for the Yeah, yeah. Here? So normative means uh, there's a set of values that are determining what it is that should be delivered. So uh, decisions about curriculum, what, what are the topics in mm -hmm. the class are really normative. You know, I imagine English departments battle over this. Do, do all students have to take Shakespeare or Chaucer? Right. And that, that's kind of a normative decision. And, and so a lot of people, when they start schools, they want these schools, they have this vision of what a child should be yeah. and what a perfect school would be. And this, this is really normative. They, 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 this is their idyllic world that they're trying to create. They don't realize, you know, whatever it is you're trying to do, there's actually evidence going to help you do it better. And I don't think people know this. Right. You know, right. This, so the this science of learning is kind of rising where it's bringing more and more evidence that helps people realize, oh, if I did it this way, it would actually allow me to achieve my goals even better. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, I mean, I know there's a piece in education about this research based practice and yeah. everybody says research based yeah, yeah. practice. But I think what you're touching on is the, the rubber meeting the road of actually digging in and finding that research or whatever it is that. Yeah. So that, so that's a challenge. Fi finding the relevant research is tough. Uh, you know, the hard to search. You search on the word like identity mm -hmm. and you're just going to get a mountain of crazy stuff. It's really hard to navigate. So, so uh, a couple of my graduate students and I wrote a book to try and help uh, called The ABCs of Learning. Yeah. And each chapter, like A is for analogy, B is for belonging, E is for elaboration, X is for excitement. Yeah, we cheated. Uh, <laughs> so so this, is, this is an attempt to make it packageable so people can understand sort of uh, how you can take these ideas and be creative and what's the science behind them. But I do think there's this... this uh, thing in front of that that you need to solve. So, you know, as dean, I go around and I talk to a lot of people about, you know, this is this is how you can improve education. And oftentimes, they don't, they're, the response is, look, I went to school, I already know. Right? So I've been there, I know. Yeah. And, and so they, you can see, they don't quite listen. On the other hand, if they're young parents and they've never had kids, Every single thing I say about parenting, they listen to. Wow. So there's this funny thing about education where everybody's been there, so they think they know. And anything you tell them, they think is obvious because they sort of hear what they think they hear. Right. And so to try and get people to realize, no, it's, it's not just what you do, you know, right. and what you've experienced. And there's ways to improve that. So I think, I think that's kind of the, that and helping them understand evidence can help them. These are, these are the two challenges. Yeah, and it goes back to this, everybody went to school, yeah, yeah. so everybody's an expert in what school should look like. That's right. But most of us don't have a lot of bad memories of our time <laughs> in school, and we couldn't wait to get out. Yeah. So clearly, the experience we're having usually isn't the one that we right. want to fall back on. We're, I'm going to decide, design a middle school where no child has puberty. <laughs> <laughs> because that was the worst part of That's growing right. up, right? So right. right. <laughs> that's our new normative behavior in school. <laughs> you know, I love, I love having you as a guest because you're preempting every single question I've got. So you just got it all there for me. Right, but right. I do want to jump back to the the ABCs of learning because yeah. I I'm I'm through C so yeah, yeah. far and so these contrasting cases right? Right, right and I'm loving the book so far I haven't got through the whole thing yet nobody can it it is people make this mistake that they think it's a read through like it has one thesis right and each chapter is another angle on that thesis it's not it's not that there right. there are 26 different chapters on different ways that people learn and yeah. so it. Uh, it reading it straight through would be uh, painful, and it has a really great guide at the end yeah. to help people find where yeah, to yeah. seek what they need. So it's really set up for this sort of quick reference approach. Yeah, yeah. Although we we sort of never mention that in any of the material, so it, <laughs> nobody finds it. This uh, this problem index focus that says things like. Uh, 
child child is sitting in the back of the class and bored and right. then it tells you what do you do to go solve that it tells you which chapter so yeah um, yeah so it's an in, so uh, this came from a class I taught here uh, where it took me a while to figure out in 10 weeks how to get a format that really helps students sample sort of what is the nature of research in this space and then the breadth because there's so many different ways that people learn like you know your immune system learns mm-hmm. right if, if you get uh, have to get a stem cell transplant to replace your your bone marrow you, you have no memory of any prior infections and so it has to learn again oh wow so all, we have all these systems that are learning our perceptual motor system language and and they all have different appetites and yeah. so people tend to think of learning as a single thing, but really there's all these different things and sort of different rules that regulate how these different systems go about it. So we, we kind of wanted to help people see that. And it turned out this trope of saying, you know, the first class is A is for analogy, which allows me to talk about kind of like cognitive phenomenon, worked really well because students were always sort of like, well, what's the next letter? <laughs> it's B. <laughs> well, right. Well, I'd, I would jump around. So. Right, right. So uh, it, it worked well, and I had materials for about 12 letters, and so we just decided to make a book out of it. So yeah. it was fun. So, was fun. I, I mean, I think you said this in the intro to the book, something about we could have done A to Z 10 times because yeah, there's so yeah. many interesting things. So yeah. how do you go about choosing just 26 things to make this book of a handbook, basically, for teachers to reference? Uh, so here, here's a not true answer, okay. but there's a little truth. Uh, you've now done 20 of the letters, and there's six letters left, like X, Q, and you're busy saying, can I think of a title? And if you think <laughs> of the title, you say, okay, that's the topic. Uh, uh, there's sort of, there's, there's some method to the madness. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's kind of a sampling matrix. So we want a certain amount of stuff on uh, development, you know, early learning, certain amount of stuff on social learning, a certain amount of stuff on sort of cognitive learning, certain amount of stuff on pure memory, certain amount of stuff on culture and norms. And uh, so we, we sample through there. And then, you know, the things that we don't cover are like attention. Okay. And how, how do you train attention and things like that? So that would be the next day. Right. And then some of it is where I have expertise. Yeah. You know, it's easier for me to write about things I have expertise, whereas we did a chapter on sleep, uh, Z. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that's clever. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. Well, that was a last minute pull. Uh-huh. Uh, but, you know, there, this was a literature I knew was moving quickly, but I didn't know it. Yeah. And so you, you read up on it, and it was fascinating, but, but it takes a lot of time. So you, you sample that way. Right. So it's a, li- a little bit of practicality. So there's a certain level of seeking out the things that you think are central, yeah. a certain level of overlapping that with what yeah. you know, yeah. and then a certain level of filling in the rest to yeah, make yeah. it all coherent. Yeah. Uh-huh. As, as coherent as, 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 possi- yeah. <laughs> as coherent as I can possibly be. As much be. as you would like it to be coherent. Yeah. 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 It was interesting. You know, it, it is... Uh, 26 chapters that all sort of have a thesis. It was like writing 26 introductions to dissertations. Oh, so, wow. The difference is when you write a book, you can have an attitude. Mm. You know, you can really have a voice. When, when you're writing like a dissertation or a journal article, you have to sort of behave. Right. You know, and follow that format. And you can't use I, things like that. Whereas right. you write a book, you can do whatever you want. No so, zingers at the end of the uh, dissertation? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, not on the second draft. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's funny. I, I like how you throw that in the second draft. <laughs> Probably in the first draft. Uh, so I wanted to just think a little bit about the main hurdles that you see to really effective education. I think there's a lot of talk about where education should go, and there's a lot of push and pull between where we're coming from, the things that we've seen and done in education, and the places where we're heading, which may be so different qualitatively, just completely different than what we've seen in the past. What are some hurdles between bridging that gap between where we've been and where we've going, or going in your mind? Yeah, so so I mentioned one, which is uh, because people went to school, they think they know. Yeah. And so so I think that's a big hurdle. Uh, so so learning is sort of a process by which people adapt. Mm. Education is a giant enterprise that's designed to support that and to support social mobility and the goals of society. Uh, so education is the second largest sector behind healthcare. 
Wow. Yeah, so it's a massive enterprise. So trying to change that kind of enterprise is is slow, just like in medicine. You know, once they, they had discovered you should wash your hands before surgery, and it mm-hmm. took about 50 years before that became standard practice. Right. So, so big enterprises, tough to move around. You know, I think one of, and um, so, so the era of data is going to help. I think it, 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 the more evidence on what kinds of schools work and easier to collect and find out. So big data is going to make a difference, I think, in, in sort of being able to enable uh, superintendents to make decisions, for okay. example. So a great, a great story around this was uh, we have a partnership with San Francisco Unified School District and a partnership with uh, Sequoia Union, which is our local high school district, and then all the elementary school districts that feed in, like Portola Valley, Menlo Park, Redwood City, Ravenswood. And uh, we, we, they, they, we, the superintendents come up with questions, uh, or the team does, and then we get faculty to sort of do research close to those questions. One of the questions in San Francisco Unified was there were 10 to 12 teachers who had put together an ethnic studies course. And uh, so this is a lot of energy, a lot of time. And, uh, and so the, super, the school district is trying to decide, do we sustain this or do we, do we cut it? Because mm-hmm. it, you know, it, it is resource intensive. Right. So because we had access to their administrative data, which means sort of kids' grades and attendance and things like that, uh, Professor Tom D went in and he actually was able to show that the kids who had taken the ethnic studies course were doing better in all their other classes as a result. They, they were more likely to come to school. They were more likely to pay attention. So this kind of easy access to data to answer very important policy questions, I think this is the future. And mm-hmm. so we want to get better at it. You know, that, so that, that's one important uh, thing. I think a second challenge for changing, you know, so uh, people want school choice, let's say, charter schools, uh, maybe even vouchers, and mm-hmm. people choose, you know, independent of the financial model of it. Uh, a difficulty with this approach is that it's very hard for the consumer to decide if something's actually good in learning. Mm, yeah. It's it's very hard to know, like, if you're learning. It's very hard to judge whether a certain environment is a good environment for learning. And so you're going to rely on your sort of normative judgment. Oh, look, they have paintings on the wall. I like this kind of place. Yeah. So this is really tough, you know, because the market isn't going to work very well for schools. Yeah. You know, and so, so you need we need to figure out better ways to reveal kind of what is the value of a school and not a school. Uh, a good school and not such a good school, because as parents, it's very hard to be a good consumer. Yeah. So this is, I think, this is a this is a grand challenge. You know, how, how can we help people sort of uh, be aware of what it is they're getting? So can I see? Just I want to make sure I understand this. So it sounds like what you're saying is the ability for people to access information and use it to make better decisions around education and educational participations. Right. right maybe through data and other types of, of getting information to yeah. people in a meaningful and efficient way. I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. And then, you know, the sort of what, and you want data that point to things you care about, right? So if your goal is for your child to develop a sense of purpose, their grades and their attendance and whether they make it into college aren't really the right data. Yeah. So, so we need to get clever about the kinds of things that we evaluate. You know, and, yeah. and so I, I do think this. So a lot of people talk about personalization. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'm not, and a lot of people have different views of this. To be able to do this well, you you kind of need evidence about people that enables you to personalize, right? You know, and, yeah, and yeah. so what what should that be? So I think I think these are like uh, it's one of the grand challenges where I think we're going to make headway, okay. which is we're going to get uh, better data, better systems, better measures, uh, better abilities to analyze it in in. So I think it'll help uh, policymakers, it'll help administrators, it'll help parents, and all that I think will feed down to help the kids. So I think this is one area where there's going to be a lot of change. You just want to make sure you use the right measures, because whenever you use a test, Mm -hmm. everybody chases the test. So you've got to be very careful. Yeah, we automatically value the thing that we have feedback to be able to measure. That's right. Right. That's right. It's it's a a process of determining what is valued and important just simply by saying this is what we're going to measure. 
Yeah, I think that's right. So, yeah. so these, it's the tail that wags the dog. You yeah, know, you, you go, you go to uh, say Hong Kong or Beijing. You know, it's all about the test. There's one test, and yeah. you prep for that test. You go to the medical school here; it's the same way. Right. You know, there's there's a test that's going to determine where you're going to do your residency. Wow. You focus on that. You don't focus on your classes. You focus on that test. As you should, because it's so. Who wouldn't? Right. I mean, you'd be insane to say, yeah. "I'm going to rise above." It's sort of like, <laughs> "I'm going to rise above," and I'm going to be going to the worst medical school cool in America. Yeah. Know, so. It reminds me of uh, one of my favorite historians, Will Durant. Yeah, he, I know this name. Oh, he's great. Yeah. He, has a, he said something in one of his books, trying to change society on your own is like being a drop of water on the tip of a tidal wave. <laughs> and you're, you have no hope on your own. And it, so, so he didn't subscribe to the great man theory. <laughs> uh, maybe in other context, yeah, he does yeah. have an entire book about some no. of the greatest minds in history, too. So no. Tol- Tolstoy, in, uh, I think it's Warren Peace has this metaphor of Napoleon. Mm-hmm. He's like on a runaway carriage, and he, all he can do is just dab the brakes a little. You know, right. <laughs> he has nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's a similar idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I think I think this is uh, for people to get clear on where what are the values of education for them, and then to figure out how can you find out if things are achieving that. I think these these are important goals. I think we can we'll be much closer to being able to do that. Than, yeah. than we used to be, I think. Uh, so that those are, I think those are two important things. You know, there's other things like, uh, um, you know, uh, things that happen outside of school. Uh, how can we improve that so people start to develop identities that uh, enable them to participate? You know, uh, especially in a world in which diversity is more apparent, yeah. and you're having to work across differences. A lot of people look to outside of school to develop sort of the capacities to engage as a good citizen, a good participant. Mm. In part because uh, school can be kind of slow to change. You know, yeah, and, and so a lot of people are looking there. There, there is a consu- again. There's a problem as a consumer. You don't know what you're getting when you sign your kids up for right. summer camp that has a certain mission statement and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to go back to something you mentioned a little while ago about this. Uh, it, it was sort of an offhanded analogy you used about resetting the immune system, mm-hmm. and this transplant makes a, a, a do-over in, yeah. in the, the past knowledge moving yeah, towards yeah. future knowledge. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's an analogy to that in learning where we could think about resetting teachers or students' expectations in a way where we actually can try some of these new ex- new ideas yeah. or expectations in a classroom without fighting the, the schema or the pre yeah, yeah. knowledge. Yeah, so I have a paper that's called Prior Knowledge, you know, uh, you can't live with it. You can't live without it. Yeah. And so they have all this prior knowledge, and you build up these explanations of the world. It's very hard to move them. Just think of the scientific revolutions. You know, mm-hmm. where suddenly, you know, uh, Copernicus is sort of explaining there's a force that keeps the planets rotating around the sun, whereas everybody be- before thought it was gods. Right. You know, how do you overcome that? Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I think uh, just. Uh, Giving people uh, evidence that speaks to them so they can see it. Uh, giving them a chance to engage in things that are foreign. So I think a lot of people are adverse. They'd, in, at the university level, the attempts to bring in active learning, you know, to sort of break the big hall lecture mm-hmm. format only, and then you know, give students a chance to interact. Uh, people generally resist that. Yeah. But then after they've done it for a year, they would never go back. Wow. And yeah. so, so the challenge is, how do you get people in in a fun way and give them space to be innovative and experiment? And this is kind of the challenge because, again, changing, require, adapting is a higher energy state than just doing what you always do. Right. So how do you get people to commit that energy? But if you do, afterwards, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna like it and they're going to stick with it, assuming they're not in an environment that's punishing of mistakes. Yeah, I believe it was Benjamin Franklin that said a mind once stretched to its new a new form never retains it or never goes back to its old form. That's nice. Yeah. Oh, he's so good. Oh, he is good. Yeah, <laughs> better than me for sure. And all of us. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah so the, there's different theories about this at the college level. Like one is cha- change the. Uh, Incentive system, like the tenure criteria, make it right. more forceful about about better teaching. But you know the problem is the feedback you get about how you're teaching is very bad. Like course ratings really don't tell you very much. Right. It's not actionable. Like if I get a three, I don't know. 
Right. Uh, so, so if we wanted to sort of hold faculty to higher standards of teaching and determine their raises or their tenure based on that, we need a whole new evaluation system. Again, it's evidence. Yeah. Uh, other people want a softer touch. You know, it's mm-hmm. more of a carrot than a stick, and yeah. sort of try and engage them in into this practice and let them see. I'm I'm a big fan of sort of saying, look, take uh, 20% of your classes and just try something new. The other 80% can be the old style. Do 20%. Uh, if half of those classes work, hang on to them for the next year, and then try a new 20%. Okay. As a way to people sort of ramp themselves into it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But but it is more work, and so how do you get people to do something that's foreign? They're not sure they like it, and suddenly they're defensive because you're telling them, you know, you could be doing better if you tried this, and they're like, "What's wrong with what I'm doing?" Right. You know. So right. so it's uh, uh, well. So the School of Education spends a lot of time on professional development. Okay. We prepare uh, teachers. So about a quarter of our students are in teacher preparation. You know, the, another quarter are master students, and 50% are actually doctoral students who will become researchers. Uh, so, so we spend a lot of time preparing new teachers and really getting them to understand why you would do the state of the art and how you execute it. The professional development is interesting. So here we're going out to teachers who've been out four to five years, mm-hmm. and how do you help them change their practice when they sort of have a set of routines? And uh, you know, in in when I was a teacher, the way it would work is there would be someone who would come in your school once a year for a day, right? And you'd have a workshop, and you know. After, at the end of a day, if I remember two or three things, I'm kind of pumped, right. you know, because it's a day. It's eight hours of yeah. someone, you know, telling you what you should think, and then and then I would use one of them. So it turns out you kind of need to get uh, groups of people together. You need that social function where they all start to talk about it and begin to feel it on, and they it becomes more normative, more of a norm to actually consider these new ways of teaching. I think you need to reach them sort of where where they work. You sort of say no, for what you're doing, how about something like this, and sort of explain it, and then it begins to capture them. Yeah. But but it, 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 it's higher touch than, yeah. than, than people used to think. Right, right. You can't change someone's behaviors and attitudes and beliefs in a day PD. That's not very going to happen. I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. So and this is actually something I really did want to talk with you about. And, and all the others were not? Oh, they all are, actually. But I, I, want, to, I want to dwell on this for a few minutes about, okay. about this idea of collaborating and bringing people together to yeah. change behaviors. Yeah. And I was, you know, my my understanding and, and experience has been that our our system is set up to value grades and value individual achievement, and it, it almost stops people from seeing how much that social and collaborative interactions yeah. really bring to the table. Uh, so I don't think those things are incommensurable. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think there are things in education where there's a very difficult tension. So meritocracy yeah. and equity are a very difficult set of issues, both extremely important. How do you reconcile these? They're, so meritocracy is the idea that people get to where they need to be based on how good they are, how smart they are, how deserving they are. Yeah, something like More that. More or less. Yeah, yeah. And then equity is the idea that everybody has different needs and they right. should have their needs met regardless of if it's all the same or different. Right. It's each according to his needs. So right. so equity is kind of a socialist. It's, it's, it's at least different one than version. equality, right? Uh, right. So equal, equity is, if, you know, I may be too narrow on this, but equity to me, uh, sometimes it spills over and it includes things like social justice in a, mm-hmm. a large space. When I think of equity, I try and keep it under intellectual control. I actually think of it as a question of the distribution of resources. Mm, so okay. I view it as kind of an economics position, very Marxian. Yeah. You know, each according to their needs and then from each according to their abilities. So, so yeah, so you look at different groups and you say, well, to, these people need more resources for whatever reason, you know. That, that would be equity. Equality, Generally, uh, maybe more of a legal concept. Okay. You know, social justice, equality, yeah. fairness uh, yeah. is in a legal space where rights, you know, do we all have equal rights? Things okay. like that, which is different okay. than the distribution of resources. I'm not an expert in this. This, yeah, this is just fine. sort of the way I formulate it yeah. to help me sort of keep it from becoming too sprawling and spilling over to so many topics that you can't make headway. So equity for me, distribution of resources, Equality, social justice, really kind of legal concepts about rights okay. and, and privileges. Okay, and there's this tension between 
getting people the opportunities based on their merit yeah. versus bringing the opportunities to the people who need them and that's that makes sense it's a natural tension it's, it's just it's a t- it's tough cuz yeah. you know how how much uh, how much how do you decide if someone has merit if they've been in a situation that doesn't give them zero opportunity for example right, right. so it, i mean i do think there's ways to do this but but it's very complicated um so, so where were we? Bring me back. Reset. Um, Give me yeah. a radio reset. Yeah, we were just talking about the 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 balance between that, and I think I think we gave it enough actually. Just, oh, good. Just talking about how those two things are connected and different, and I do actually want to get you out of here pretty soon because I I promised I would honor your time, and we're already Thank sort you. of running out. Okay. So I guess my last question is just: Is there anything else you'd like to leave people with as? A last resource to look up, or uh, words of encouragement, how to move forward, or any last little bits you want to leave for the audience? Uh, I think I'm going to end a little bit where I started. Mm -hmm. Teaching is, uh, it's something only humans do. Uh, It so learning is a basic human need, right? And which, to my mind, makes it a fundamental right. But the other side of that is that learning is such an important need that we've also evolved to teach. And so teaching is a basic need. We, as parents, you teach. As gossips, you teach. We really need to teach. I think it. I also like to think of it as a right. Yeah. That you should have the right to teach. The chat, and which makes it uh, teaching incredibly satisfying. You want to pursue opportunities to do it. But here's the one kicker: the fact that we've evolved to teach doesn't mean we're particularly good at it. Mm, yeah. You can get better at it. You're not born to be a teacher. Well, sorry, we're all born to be teachers. We evolve that way. It's something we have to do. We're not born to be good teachers. Right. And so, so if you learn something about it, it's even more satisfying. You can do even better. Wow. And so, I, I encourage people to sort of recognize how much they enjoy tutoring other people. Uh, you know, a lot of students here were probably served as tutors in high school and things. It's really satisfying. And so, you sort of figure out, are there ways I can do this more? Maybe not through becoming a professional teacher, but other other ways to find your chance to help other people with all the, the knowledge and gifts that you've you've gotten at Stanford. Right. So, that's how I would end. Go, oh, go, go teachers. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> that is beautiful. Okay. So, I just wanted to thank Thank you one last time for coming in, making the time to talk. Yeah, with thanks me. for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. It was a lot appreciate of fun. It. Yeah. So this is a discussion with Dan Schwartz, the dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Education. I appreciate the audience listening in. I'm Ben Woodford, the host of Modern Education. We'll be back next week with another guest and another conversation around teaching and learning and everything to do with education. So thank you one more time. This is Ben Woodford with Modern Education.